my mother-in-law decorates all out for Halloween in the way only a retired elementary school teacher can. <laughs> Witches' hats, fake spiders, and great pumpkin flags, all more silly than spooky. Among, among the many decorations, she has a skeleton figure she named Baldwin. Baldwin. It's a skeleton, so it's bald. <laughs> right? She had to explain it to me also. <laughs> Every October, she'd put Baldwin in the front window right by the door. It's one of those motion-activated things that starts cracking corny jokes at trick-or-treaters. Jokes like, why didn't the skeleton dance at the Halloween party? He had no body to dance with. <laughs> After they found Dave, she stopped putting Baldwin out. I first learned about Dave on my third date with John. John and I were both in graduate school in New York City, and for this particular date, we went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. John had mentioned that he had two sisters on one of our first two dates. I remember this detail clearly because I liked the symmetry with the fact that I had two brothers. There, in front of the Degas paintings of ballerinas, John told me how his mother used to teach dance classes on Saturday mornings in the basement of their house. His sisters took the classes along with the other neighborhood girls. His dad would take John and his brother out for breakfast and then usually to the old Denver airport to watch planes take off so that they'd be out from underfoot during the lessons. You have a brother? I asked. John joked, saying that he was going to introduce a new sibling to me on each of our subsequent dates and left it at that. A few weeks later, when things were moving faster for us, we lay in bed in his sixth floor walk up and told each other our secrets. This is when John told me about Dave. At that point, Dave had been gone almost 20 years. No one in the family said missing. It was that Dave had left. He was out there somewhere. In 1982, Dave helped John move into his dorm when John started college. They unloaded the car and carried all of the clothes and stuff up to John's room in one of those high-rise dormitories at the University of Colorado. They had talked about trying to squeeze in a round of golf, something they both enjoyed. But John was caught up in the excitement of starting college and decided to call off the golf game. The last time John saw his brother was as the elevator doors closed down that dormitory hallway. Dave drove the short distance back to the family home in Denver, asked to borrow his dad's car, and left. None of it seemed out of the ordinary, except that he did not come back that night, or the next night, or the next. Several weeks later, the police found the car on an unpaved road ne uh, near a clearing in the woods in the Front Range. The back window had been busted out. There were no other clues. There was a train trestle near where the car was found, and some family members were convinced that David jumped on a train to California. You see, the family had taken vacations in Southern California for years while they were growing up. All throughout the 1970s, my father-in-law, Al, would take the Friday off before the school spring break and come home with to the car my mother-in-law had packed. The parents and the four children piled in and drove through the night and all the next day out to California. They'd spend a week on the beach in Laguna or San Diego before driving the 19 hours back again to return to school and work. After the car was found, my father-in-law was so convinced that Dave was in California that he spent all of his vacation days combing Venice Beach, showing everyone he encountered pictures of Dave. At one point, a mall security guard looked at the picture and said, that's Dave. My father-in-law was supposed to meet the security guard again the next day, but he didn't show. 
Later, after not being able to find that security guard again, the police questioned whether my father-in-law had imagined or misinterpreted the whole exchange. Al also kept Dave's savings account open and put money in it from time to time. There were no withdrawals. Family and friends hired private investigators and even consulted psychics. The only time there seemed like there might be a breakthrough was when someone of the same name was arrested in San Diego. It turned out to be a case of stolen identity. At some point after Dave left, his elderly grandmother would get phone calls with no one speaking on the other side. In those days before cell phones or caller ID, she would talk to the caller as if they were Dave, telling him everyone missed him and that they didn't care what had happened and that they all hoped he'd come home. All the while, time passed. Dave was gone for the holidays. A year, two years. John graduated from college. The older sister got married. The younger sister got married. His grandmother died. I met John. Once I started to spend time with the family, I realized that it was a given that for, ev uh, for John's mom, every first evening star, every rainbow, every wish on birthday candles was for word from Dave. It was the absence that was always present. Every year on the anniversary of the day Dave left, and again on Dave's birthday, John, his sisters, and his parents would call each other and think about Dave together. Then one freezing day in late February 2007, when John and I lived in Chicago, John came into our condo deep in conversation on the phone. His voice sounded different, intense, serious, and I knew something was up. But I was big pregnant, and the hot water in our building had been out for three weeks, so my mind was full of these sorts of issues, and I wasn't expecting John to look over me and mouth, they found Dave. And they did, sort of. In another part of Colorado, a cable guy working in someone's garage saw part of a human skull on a shelf. The homeowner explained that he found it when he was hunting in the woods. The cable guy quickly reported it to the police who took the skull and questioned the man. He showed them on a map approximately where he found it. It was in the woods not too far from where Dave's car was found. Time, weather, dense undergrowth, and even gravity, since it was on the side of a mountain, meant that the police could not find any additional parts of the skeleton. One officer said that if the hunter had even just walked on the other side of the tree, he wouldn't have seen the part that he did find. With any, without any direct connection to Dave, nothing was said to the family. When Dave left in 1982, there wasn't the kind of DNA technology that there is today. And even now, it does not yield the kind of clear-cut answers TV crime shows would have you believe. My in-laws submitted samples once DNA testing became more common, even as they hoped it would never be used. Cold cases aren't given a high priority in crime labs, and the skull languished there for a couple of years more. Finally, it gave up enough information for the lab folks to definitively rule out the only other person reported missing in that area of the county. The lab folks could not rule out that it was either an immediate male predecessor of my mother-in-law or one of her male offspring. The whereabouts of her father, long dead, were known. John was alive and well with me, so that left Dave or at least in the language of the report, it could not be ruled out that it was Dave. That, along with the location of the abandoned car, was close enough for the police. Dave had been gone 25 years. The police officer who worked uh, with the family over the years came out of her retirement to tell my in-laws the news. 
She also gave me a couple of Harley Davidson bibs for the baby, the only grandson in the family, and she told me that I should name the baby David. We did not name our son after Dave, and we still do not know what really happened to him. Once Al asked John if he really thought the skull was Dave's. John told him yes, but John still has questions. And I could tell it was hard for Al to stop thinking, stop hoping that Dave was out there somewhere. Then six years ago, Al died at the age of 92. He had not seen his oldest son for 34 years. At Al's memorial service, the family had the small container of the cremated remains of the skull added to Al's ashes and placed in the columbarium. They are together now, maybe. My mother-in-law decorated for Halloween this year just like she always does, but like every October since Dave was found, the Baldwin skeleton stays in the closet. <laughs>